docents. The exhibit is color coded so that you can go by groupings. Orange is civic leaders and educators. Here we have an image of Ruth Ann Kellum flanked by her husband when Ruth Ann was elected to the city council in Hampton. Here we have Mayor Ann Kilgore with the designs of the Coliseum. Kilgore was the first female mayor in Hampton. Here we have other important females in politics and civic influence or civic affairs. Mamie Locke, who's in the Senate, and Gloria Presley, who is a wonderfully, colorfully hatted local uh, civic leader and um, educator. educator. Mm -hmm. Here we have Molly Darling, who was a, originally a teacher at Hampton University, it is now, but when she was there it was Hampton Institute. And she brought many Indians, or at least many Indians came from the West, and she went to the West and helped Indians out before she came to Hampton and got married. She married a very wealthy man, and they lived in this palatial home, Cedar Hall, which is no longer there. But Molly Darling was a very important image for women in Hampton. And we, she was a civic leader in many ways the Kikatan Literary Society, which is still going, for example, she founded. She was a, uh, had a great, had a lot of good ideas, but of course was not, uh, she, you wouldn't have found her in a protest like what we just saw, but if it weren't for people like Molly Darling, we probably wouldn't have had as many people at the protest that you see. She's a real civic leader. Here we have earlier civic leaders who are national civic leaders. Two first ladies have had contacts with Hampton. This is Julia Tyler, originally from Long Island, New York, a Yankee who came married, became the second wife of President Tyler, and they lived in Hampton. They built their summer home in Hampton, Villa Margaret. It's gone now too, but it was there for a good long time. And Julia Tyler was the first first lady at least since Abigail Adams, to be a public figure, to consciously assume a public role, to speak before the public, even at her, she was in her 20s, if I remember right, and she had like eight children, but she still is an important leader and connected to Hampton. This is Eleanor Roosevelt at Hampton. She came here because of Bangley Field, and of course her husband, being in a wheelchair, needed help for his public meetings, for meeting the public all over the country, and his wife, Eleanor, fulfilled that role. Here she is in Hampton, uh, inspecting, being invited into the mess hall at the Air Force Academy, I mean at uh, Langley Field Air Force Base. Um, I just wanted to <clears throat> add, um, there is a theme that um, you can choose various themes to carry you all the way through the exhibit, but one of them is the loopholes women found in <clears throat> whatever era they were living in and what, uh, whatever re uh, cultural and legal restraints they were living in. Uh, they found ways to <clears throat> move beyond those um, restraints and that goes all the way back to the colonial period. Here we have two women who never held elective office but wielded an enormous amount of public influence. Eleanor Roosevelt was certainly one of the most admired public figures of the 20th century and um, you know, one of the artifacts that you might be uh, interested in at least pointing out is this is a letter from Eleanor Roosevelt to a, a schoolgirl here in Hampton saying <clears throat> that one day she believed that there would be a woman president. Uh, and <clears throat> this, going into this year, that's <laughs> an extremely um, relevant and interesting artifact, I think, because we may actually be have a woman on the horizon who may be president, and she does say women will first have to hold lower office um, before they aspire to the presidency, so um, 
There you go. <laughs> Another theme that you as a docent may wish to pursue is textiles. Of course, it's a little cliche that we have women's dresses as the textile which is most relevant to women. Here we have Mrs. Darling's top or bodice. Blouse. Blouse. And you can see that it, well, you may not be able to see, but she had these handmade and she was not a very large person with the lace. You can see uh, an excellent notion of women's dress, but compare these two textiles over here. These are both from the same period of time. I think maybe even more so than with uh, men's dress, women's dress, uh, because women were so conscious of their, public, of their presentation um, in dress, makeup, hairstyles, and so forth. And this is not frivolous. This is a way of presenting themselves on the stage of society and the way that they want others to perceive them. And as Wiz said, in this short interval uh, <clears throat> before World War I, <laughs> we have actually a uh, woman's wedding dress, very demure. Um, over here, uh, a short time later in the Roaring Twenties, separated by no more than a few years, we have a radically different style in women's dress. Here we have the flapper or the self-conceived modern woman who wants more freedom of movement, uh, who's out in the world drinking, smoking. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, the, the dress itself shows you freedom as opposed to being sort of encased. Interestingly enough, white was not always the color for wedding dresses. This was a dress that was made for the wedding just before the uh, First World War. But you can see the amount of freedom that women are claiming for themselves. My mom was a flapper, and I don't, she didn't, I don't remember her dress like this, but she had pictures of herself dressed like this, and she was, was one of the most important influences in my life, a woman who was at home her whole life, but was out in public all the time, too. Women were really um, sort of, <clears throat> some of the social restraints placed on women were deliberately flaunted. Women were smoking in public. They bobbed their hair. They were actually recreating. They showed their knees. Yes, recreating what their role uh, as women was. and. Uh, we thought this was perhaps one of the most dramatic examples of that within, say, a five-year period. And we had a hard time getting it into the case, too, by the way. <laughs> Over here, you see uh, people who've always had women in public positions. These are Native Americans, and this is from the time of the 16th century, a woman who was apparently an important woman there. Here is Ann Richardson, who is the chief of her own tribe today in Virginia. We tell the story here of other women leaders, the Native Americans, thanks to, as the text tells you and that Donna wrote here, the fact that they were, they had an important influence over the local economy, which was a household economy, made them or gave them the entree to be in public more, and they were, and still are. So another theme here, our sub-theme, is that we don't want to lump all women together. Uh, Native American women had obviously uh, more exalted status in their society than European women did. Uh, and in the colonial period, especially um, in the late colonial period, black and white women had uh, very different status um, as well uh, and different obligations and so forth so we want it in the timeline we really do try to um, sort that out um, another uh, loophole that we can see uh, in women of influence we have civic leaders and educators and as you'll note um, and of course in the 20th century women had the opportunity to be elected uh, 
the they won, they won that right. They won that right. Um, but the two professions that women had uh, achieved a real firm presence in, in the 20th century were nursing and education teachers. And <clears throat> you'll be able to note as you go through Anne Kilgore, a very, uh, one of Hampton's most influential mayors who had, uh, here she is looking at the plans for the Coliseum. Um, that happened in her, in her time in office, was an educator. Uh, <clears throat> Luann, uh, Ruth, Ann. Ruth Ann, Ruth Ann Kellum was an educator. They used their roles. Molly Darling came here as an educator. As an educator. They used their roles as educators as sort of a platform to, for civic activism, for a more public presence. And if you're an educator, you already <laughs> are very much uh, tied into the community, community issues. So it's a very natural uh, next step for an educator to become a civic leader. And that's exactly what happened. And the women, you know, did not have to seize that opportunity. They chose to seize that opportunity uh, to act really on behalf of others and to, to be civic activists and spokesmen for their communities. We don't have a separate section on educators because almost all of the sections that we have have educators in them, people who have gone from education to a different life, perhaps, but educators pervade this exhibit. Over here, Donna mentioned health care and nursing. And here we have women in health care here in Hampton, Virginia. Dorothea Dix came to Hampton and was um, at Fort Monroe. Dorothea Dix ins insisted that her pupils, her nurses, treat both sides, which didn't get her a lot of leeway with a lot of people. But here you have Dorothea Dix. Here we have the hospital in Hampton during the Civil War. Dix is really important as an early nurse. Uh, we don't have a picture of her here, but we also have Catherine Prescott Wormley, who was a nurse during the Civil War. Women were also midwives. This is Rosa Callis Brown, the grandmother of uh, Chauncey Brown, who is a, a docent here. Maybe I'm speaking to you now, Chauncey. And, uh, this tells the story of black midwifery, and, but she was so good, she was as good, she, doctors consulted her, and she birthed white children as well as black children. Uh, this is Gerard Chambers, who lived to be age 99 and was the longtime surveyor of Hampton and Elizabeth City County when he was ten, nine years old, and he was birthed by Rosa Brown. Here we have the, a, a graduating class of nurses at Hampton, now University, but then it was Hampton Institute. You'll notice that the staff is white and the nurses are black. There are white nurses in this picture, you just can't see them. But nursing was both an avenue that women could go into and perform public service as well as making a living. In this case, just the nursing school was important because young black ladies at Hampton University had trouble getting into existing nursing schools. So, and we'll show you a picture of her uh, in just a second. Uh, she's also right back here, but Mabel Bacon, who was a teacher from Hampton Institute, a prodigy who graduated from Harvard without ever having attended a class at Harvard because she took the exams and got a degree. She took it upon herself when her students couldn't get into nursing school elsewhere to found a nursing school here at Hampton. She had the means to do that and eventually that became the Dixie Hospital. Dixie was her name for it not because of she was a southerner, she wasn't, or glorifying the South, but because her horse was named Dixie and she named it after her horse. Let's go over here and see her. <laughs> 